Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 26th of November and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 29th of November. And up until Friday of this week, we've been shaping up for a fairly decent one for the FTSE 100, even if other European stocks were predominantly on the back foot. And I think to a large extent, most of the market had checked out when it comes to uh, movements in the market for this week with the US off for their Thanksgiving break. Liquidity was starting to dry up, trading was fairly thin. And then of course, we got the news of a new COVID variant break uh, late on Thursday night. And the result is what you see on the screen in front of you right now. The FTSE 100, which closed at 7,310 on Thursday, um, is now below 7,100. Um, the DAX is down similarly heavily. It had already been on the back foot for most of this week over concerns um, around events in Germany. So concerns about a new variant while I'm welcome, are the least of government's worries at the moment. Um, Angela Merkel in Germany is calling in vain for further restrictions to be implemented. However, there appears to be little in the way of coordinated policy at a central level in Germany to stem the spread of the virus there. Incoming, incoming Chancellor Olaf Scholz has insisted that the new government's priority is dealing with the crisis, yet he seems unwilling or unable take any further steps apart from the ones taken already at the start of the week. Germany's not alone in having to deal with the resurgence of the Delta variant. Italy has announced tighter restrictions this week along with the Czech Republic and Portugal. And now we've got these reports of the new variant, spelled NU, um, which has spooked markets and prompted travel restrictions, increased travel restrictions to a number of African countries. Also reports of two cases in Hong Kong spooked Asia markets and have pr prompted the meltdown that you've seen here this morning. At one point, um, IAG, British Airways, um, was down, opened down 20%. Now they're now down 11. Um, so um, the losses have been halved, but nonetheless, I think the thin trading conditions the fact that an awful lot of investors had already checked out this week, I think, is exacerbating the market moves that we're currently seeing today. We're not going to know for at least another two weeks as to whether or not this variant, as it is, it's much more highly transmissible, apparently. It's got up to 32 identified mutations from the Delta variant. And so, it will require an awful lot more analysis, but obviously the, the knee-jerk reaction is to shoot first and ask questions later. So what does this mean for the bullish equity market scenario that we've been trading into heading into December? Well, it certainly doesn't undermine it completely and probably gives us an opportunity for a little bit of a correction, a little bit of a pullback, given the gains that we've already seen thus far this year. If we look at the FTSE 100, for example, we can see that year to date, it's not done too badly. We can see that from here. Obviously, today's move is much starker given the fact that it's happening in fairly thin trading conditions. Um, probably the biggest down move this year. Um, certainly, if we look at, say, previous down moves, is there, there's one there in June. There's also one there back in April, and there's a two day move there. So I think we're going to need to wait a couple of days, maybe until next week, to determine whether or not this move is going to stick. What is not in doubt is that we still remain above the key support levels that have held the equity market um, over the course of the past few weeks and months. We're still above the 200-day moving average here. So even though we've broken below 7190, which I identified last week as a key support level, more importantly, we're still above um, this series of lows through here as well as the 200 day moving average. So um, keeping a close eye 
on that support level there. The same goes for the DAX, which has been under pressure for pretty much all of this week. We can see that here. But again, if you look at it on a year to date basis, we're still in pretty good shape. So that sort of begs the question in the wake of further declines as to whether we get this so-called center rally. I hate using that euphemistic term because to, to my mind, it's just a load of old nonsense. But, but nonetheless, it's going to invite speculation as to whether or not this correction that we've seen since the 19th of November just marks a little bit of a corrective um, to the overall positive narrative for stock markets that we've seen over the course of the past few weeks and months. And quite significantly, if we look all the way across here, we can see there's a really strong area of support all the way down and around the 15,000 level. So um, if we do get further weakness, it's going to take quite something to undermine the, the wider, wider bullish sentiment. If we look at the S&P, we can see that here we're still within touching distance of all time highs and not for the first time this year we've seen big big declines which have proved to be temporary in nature and then we get a bit of a rebound for me i think the key level looks to be in and around between 4580 and 4600 um obviously an awful lot of us trading desks aren't going to be fully manned today on friday so i think the key takeaway is how markets react when we when we come back on monday monday the uh the 29th of november you know what's the overarching narrative um will they shrug this off like they have pretty much every other um uh significant down move for the time being for today um we're going to have to probably accept the fact that we're going to see quite a bit of volatility um probably going to see another negative week for european equity markets and um as such, um, pick ourselves up and dust ourselves down, particularly as we're coming to month end as well, the end of November. If I, if I turn that into a weekly chart here, we can see that we've taken out pretty much every single um, week's declines um, over the course of the past four weeks, quite there. So basically, we've worked out the entire month's declines in the space of a day, um, which is quite some doing. So let me just get rid of that. So against that backdrop, uh, we look ahead to next week. The key item or the, 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 the main item that I've got my eye on is non-farm payrolls, um, which is on the, on the Friday, the 3rd of December. Um, it also ties in with the narrative of whether or not we see the Federal Reserve um, look at potentially accelerating the tapering of the bond buying program and one thing that i think today's events have done is potentially give central banks cover if they do decide that they don't want to go ahead with either the bank of england looking to raise rates in december or the federal reserve looking to accelerate the tapering of its bond buying program doesn't mean that they won't do it but it's certainly i think unless the picture becomes a lot clearer over the course of the next two to three weeks as to regards how how significant this new variant is then we could see central bankers potentially resile from the potential to tighten or pare back monetary accommodation i think pare back is rather than tighten because i don't like the word tighten but certainly in terms of the way the dollar has behaved over the course of the past few days and weeks um, we can certainly see that it has benefited the most from the increase in inflation that we've not only been seeing in the us but also across the wider global economy but i think one side effect of recent events has been the fact that oil prices which obviously have been fueling an awful lot of this inflationary pressure do appear to be finally showing signs of topping out maybe you can't say the same about natural gas prices because there are other factors at play there particularly in europe but certainly in terms of oil prices i think there is rising evidence perhaps that um, we could have seen a short-term top if we look at brent crude that's down five percent today 
Um, we've also traded below the previous lows, so that's significant. And we're also on course for the fifth successive weekly decline. And one thing about this chart that does intrigue me, um, and bear with me on this because yes, we've seen five successive weekly declines, which is probably the worst run of losses um, since all the way back uh, in early 2020, albeit on a slightly smaller scale. But what I'm seeing here is very long upper shadows on the candlesticks. And that tells me that while we're seeing significant squeezes to the upside, markets aren't able to hold on to those gains. And that for me, is potentially bearish and it potentially suggests we could well see further oil price weakness. Now that is going to be very, very positive in the lead up to Christmas if it continues, if it continues, and it's a big if, um, because ultimately fuel prices will come down, energy costs will come down, and while those higher costs that are already in the supply chain will still filter through, at the pump you're likely to see um, gasoline and fuel prices potentially come down from their currently elevated levels at the moment. Um, you know, a litre, a four star at the moment, or four star or unleaded E10 is around about 145, 150, one pound 45, one pound 50 a litre. So if we come away from that level and head back towards 140 and 135, that's obviously going to put slightly more money in consumers pockets. So I'm paying particular attention to what Brent crude prices are going to do. Certainly if we continue to fall back towards $70 a barrel on the 200 day moving average down here, then I certainly think there will be much more, there'll be more strident calls for fuel companies to pass those savings on. Okay, so that's Brent crude. So keep, keep a close eye on that over the course of the past couple of weeks, because that could start to temper inflation expectations and again once again i think give potential cover for central banks to potentially resile from a possible um, tightening of monetary policy particularly i think particularly the bank of england um, because i get the impression that um, andrew bailey is already starting to seed the ground potentially for a little bit of a pulling back when it comes to a potential rate rise just before Christmas. Certainly, I think he'll be very um, aware of the fact that if they do nudge rates up by 0.15%, the headlines will all be about Bank of England plays Scrooge and that sort of thing. So certainly it's worth something bearing in mind. In terms of the overall tightening of monetary policy thing, we've seen Euro dollar um, head back towards the lowest levels since June 2020. Um, I would expect to see, and that's basically these lows down here. Um, that's the key level for me, 111.6570. We've got to within touching distance of that to around 20 pips of it um, earlier this week. We've seen a bit of a rebound today. Um, I think more, I think, as a as a symptom of maybe what we're seeing today could maybe delay a prospect of the Fed accelerating um, a taper. Personally, I think one day, um, you know, one day's price action is probably a little bit premature when it comes to scaling back those expectations, but it is a Friday. We are heading into the weekend and um, the ECB is not going anywhere when it comes to monetary policy. The only variable at the moment is what's the Fed going to do with respect to its taper? Will it accelerate it in December from $10 billion of US Treasuries and $5 billion of MBS and make it a slightly higher amount, thus potentially bringing forward the prospect of rate rises, multiple rate rises into 2022. So that's the discussion. In that context, we've got the October payrolls report on Friday. We've got services PMIs on Friday. Um, we've already, and we've got manufacturing PMIs on the Wednesday. Now, in terms of the manufacturing and the services PMIs, these, this data is now going to be very, very stale because it will predate um, the new lockdown restrictions, the new COVID restrictions pretty much across Europe. And that's, that was borne out in the flash numbers that we saw earlier this week. Um, PMIs suggest that the 
the trend for declining PMIs came to an end because what we saw was an uptick in economic activity in November. But obviously those PMIs were taken before the deterioration um, in COVID cases, hospitalizations, and the rise in deaths. So I think in terms of, as we look forward to so project forward to December, yeah, we've seen a little bit of improvement in November, but that data is dead, it's gone, it's finished, given the changing narrative currently taking place pretty much across the euro area. In terms of the UK, UK PMIs um, still looking fairly resilient, a little bit of a slowdown in services as expected, it's expected to come down from 59.1 to 58.6 for services, while manufacturing is expected to rise modestly from 57.8 to 58.2, simply because we haven't as yet, um, touch wood, um, seen any evidence that the UK government is inclined to um, introduce new restrictions over here in the United Kingdom. Of course, that could change. And there are concerns that in some countries, um, restrictions could remain in place, which means people can't travel. Certainly expectations of a rate hike um, in the UK are not helping cable in the slightest. To a certain extent, that's becoming a victim of the stronger dollar story, um, but also I think the fact that maybe the Bank of England is starting to get cold feet again when it comes to um, tightening monetary policy in December, uh, which means that given the direction of travel, we could well see further losses in cable towards this series of lows down here, 13160. That's certainly my view at the moment, um, given the way the market is trading. It goes counter to my underlying bullish sterling view, but unfortunately, whatever my bullish sterling view is, I can't ignore what the price action is doing. As such, I need to take that into account. And the likelihood is we'll probably see further losses back towards 131.60. But as long as we hold above that, then hopefully we'll get a rebound back to the mid 130s over the course of the next month or so. But what, what is isn't in doubt is we are now down on the year when it comes to cable. And we can see that borne out from this chart here because we basically closed the end of last year at uh, 136.70 and we're now down at 133. Um, if we look at Euro sterling, that's still indulged in a little bit of a tug of war. We're getting a little bit of an uptick today. Euro is getting the benefit of the doubt as a consequence of um, rate hike expectations slipping back. So fairly solid support on Euro sterling at 83.80. Um, and resistance probably at 84.70, 84.80 for in the short to medium term. But overall, we're still pretty much in the range that we've been in um, over the course of the past six to 12 months. So, you know, we look at that there. The direction of travel is still for a slightly um, a stronger pound, but we could see a little bit of euro strength back towards 85.40 uh, and um, maybe the trend line resistance from. Uh, across these two peaks through here. So certainly, it's certainly right for a short squeeze based on that particular chart there. Um, so non-farm payrolls, what are, we, what are we expecting? Well, the October payrolls report helped to reaffirm the Fed's decision a few days before to set the ball rolling on tapering its asset purchase program. 531 new jobs were added to the US labor market in October. And we, saw a, we also saw a decent upgrade to September from 194 to 312. The unemployment rate fell to 4.6 from 4.8. Participation rate still remains the fly in the ointment for a number of Fed officials. Um, and wages were also starting to tick up as well. As we head into year end, obviously temporary hiring tends to pick up. Jobless claims starts to come down. And certainly that was borne out earlier this week when weekly jobless claims came in at 199,000, which is the lowest level since November 1969. I mean, that is, that is, such, that is a stat and a half, um, which suggests to me that, you know, while there may be concerns about inflation in the US economy, if you look at the underlying consumer data, it's still fairly positive. Retail sales are trending at a fairly decent clip personal spending remains resilient. Obviously, that was always likely to be the case heading into Thanksgiving. 
but nonetheless, um, despite concerns about higher inflation, um, the US consumers appear for the time being able to absorb those increases in inflation. And while that remains to be the case, obviously concerns about new variants notwithstanding, the direction of travel would suggest that this could well continue, barring any um, unexpected surprises into December. So what are we expecting for um, non-farms? Well, based on those weekly jobless claims numbers, it wouldn't be a surprise to see the ADP report a few days earlier at around about 500,000. Uh, along with non-farm payrolls expecting another 500,000. At some point, you'd expect to see that participation rate start to go up. So certainly be paying particular attention to that. A decent number, a very strong payrolls number, will basically put those tapering considerations back to front of mind and an accelerated taper and maybe the events of today will be a distant memory. That's how fickle markets are. At the moment, we're, you know, we're at the mercy of a big sell-off, thin trading conditions. Maybe that will change um, on Monday, Tuesday, and certainly in the wake of a decent payrolls report next week. And I think it's always important to remember that, not to get too hung up on one day's price action. It's what the overall trend is. Um, in terms of the long-term daily charts. So in terms of earnings next week, there's 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 three notable ones. Um, EasyJet is at the forefront at the moment of the concerns about this new virus, this new mutation. Um, we did close, we did open sharply uh, lower earlier this morning. We're starting to pull some of that back, which would suggest to me that there are some um, there are a few dip buyers in there and an awful lot of the bad news is already priced in. So it's EasyJet's full year numbers for 2021 on the 30th of November on Tuesday. It's been a year that's promised much but's failed to deliver. The hope at the start of this year was that vaccines would herald the return of some form of normal for a sector that's borne the brunt of the pandemic restrictions. Certainly the first half of this year that optimism was misplaced. Um, you can certainly see that in terms of the share price. Optimism of the summer season was quickly replaced by um, concerns that there wouldn't actually be any season to speak of at all. And you can certainly see that in the way that the share price has behaved over the course of the past few months. Um, as I say, we the company had to do another rights issue back in September, 1.2 billion pounds and that's helped reduce its debt to 900 million from 2 billion. EasyJets also said it had to reject an unsolicited preliminary takeover approach from a source it declined to name but most people think was probably Wizz Air um, and it's also had to go down the route selling and leasing back its aircraft to raise extra cash over the course of the past 18 months. Now at the end of the first half of this year the company, the airline reported a loss of 701 million pounds. It only flew 17% of capacity in Q3, three successive quarters of capacity below 20%. As regards for Q4, um, EasyJet said it had managed to reach 58% of 2019 levels, flying 17.3 million seats. So that was slightly above what it expected it would do in early September. Um, they were hoping for around about 60%, so 50, 58% they fell slightly short. In terms of its guidance for Q1, the, the expectation was 60 to 70% of 2019 levels. That could be in doubt now. And I think that for me, probably more than anything, is something that I'll be paying particular attention to when we look at these full year numbers um, on Tuesday. Four-year losses are expected to come in and around £1.2 billion. So that will be the second year in succession that EasyJet will have posted a billion pound loss. So that for me, I think, is the standout item of the week. We've also got um, the first half numbers from Wise, formerly known as TransferWise. They IPO'd this year at 800p. Um, since the peaks back in September, the shares have gone on a slow move lower. 
been a bit of a mixed bag. Q2 revenues came in at 133 million pound, a rise of 25% year on year. Active customers increased by 22%. Um, so I think the big question is, does the, will Wise suffer from increased competition from companies like Revolut? Um, the shares have fallen back sharply in recent in recent weeks, and that's largely on reports that three clearinghouses were working with a number of major European and US banks to speed up cross-border payments, which essentially is Wise's sandbox. So it'll be really interesting to see how they react to increased competition from the bigger banks, but certainly it's hit lows of 700p. Um, will it be able to get back to its 800p IPO launch price? And then if we're going to finish off with Kroger, that's another US retailer, supermarket retailer based in Ohio. They use Ocado. Um, they, they've got a tie up with Ocado in terms of their online delivery offering. Um, generated $460 million on revenues of $31.68 billion in its most recent quarter. But again, as with Walmart, Target, um, it's, it's battling with higher costs, but maybe investing in greater automation with its recent deals with Ocado will help, will help take some of the edge off that. Profits are expected to come in around about 67 cents a share. So um, <clears throat> I think that's pretty much it. Let me just quickly have a look at gold for any gold bugs over there. Seen a bit of a sell-off over the course of the past few days, apart from obviously today where we've seen a strong rebound, but always in the context of this nice little uptrend from here. So still in a bit of an uptrend for gold. Gold has suffered in the past few days as a result of a stronger dollar, but it's still within the confines of the upward trend that we've been in since August. Okay, so um, that's pretty much um, that's pretty much it for this week. And, uh, and this month, actually, because we'll be into December next week. Um, and please join me for non-farm payrolls on Friday, the 3rd of December at 1 p.m. Uh, 1 p.m. till 2 p.m. while I'll be covering the numbers live. And you can Q&A me to your heart's content. In the meantime, um, have a great weekend and speak to you next week. Cheers.